Hey guys, it's Bella and in this video I want to talk with you guys about, well, the sexual politics of bread in Visigothic Spain. So what I want to do here is use philology of the Gothic language in combination with a reading of Latin literature written in Visigothic Spain by the descendants at least of Gothic speaking peoples themselves to identify the kinds of sexual relationships that bred and fostered in the context of Visigothic Spain. So the Gothic words I'm going to use to interrogate this, though I'm going to draw comparisons with the Old English as well, are the words gaheva and hlefs in Gothic. So hlefs is the Gothic word for bread, and it's a cognate with the modern English word loaf, right? Um, and we have this word hlefs, and its stem is incorporated into the Gothic word gahleva, which is a compound consisting of three different parts. The ga prefix denotes a fellow or a companion, and it glosses generally the Greek prefix su, which means with or fellow. We also have hlev from the Gothic, obviously hlefs, meaning bread, and this tends to gloss the Greek word arthos which, again, is just the standard word for bread. There's nothing unusual about that. And lastly, we have the R suffix, which means a doer of X, and it's a cognate of the modern English suffix er. Uh. And as we can see here, the word gahleva in the corpus of the Gothic language that we have attested is attested three times, two of which is, are in Bible translation, so we can see which word it is glossing in the Greek. And... In John eleven sixteen, it is glossing the passage, it is glossing the Greek word symathetes, uh, which is a fellow student, a fellow disciple, um, and this is in the context of the Apostle Thomas talking to his fellow disciples of Jesus. And then, in Philipp Philippians two twenty five, it glosses the word which means a fellow soldier from the Greek statiotes. And it's, well, in this in this case, it's referring to um, Epaphroditus, his brother, and a fellow uh, who is referred to as an apostle and fellow soldier. So we also have an attestation of it in the Naples deed, where um, Merida Bocaris, which is the, um, the scribe, he sort of signs this deed um, and agrees to the sale uh, with Diakona Alla Moda Unterama with Alla Modes are Deacon Yachmith Gahlevem Unterem and with our um, well companions we don't have a gloss of the Naples deed this isn't a direct translation of anything else um, in fact the Naples deed might be the only bit of Gothic literature that we have attested, which is not a direct translation of anything else. Um, that and possibly the Bologna fragment. So it's really interesting, but we can see here that this word gahleva seems to have some kind of meaning of a companion or a fellow student, an equal though, to the speaker themselves. And we can see a little bit of the politics of bread playing out in the Scythians. Now part of the difficulty with doing philology in the Gothic language is that the texts which we have are almost all translations and the Scythians itself, I must admit in this video, probably is also a translation from Greek. And the fact that the Gothic Bible is a tr very close translation of the Greek suggests that we can't necessarily draw too strong conclusions about how what a word means and how it's being used in the same way that with Latin, for instance, we can do a search in dictionaries and corpuses and look at various ways that a given word is being used in literature from the time period to see what people meant when they said a given word in Latin. We can't do that for Gothic so much because we just don't have literature that was originally written in Gothic by the Ostrogoths. Um, but one of the few extended pieces which isn't the Bible that we have is the Scythians. And in in the seventh leaf of the Scythians that we have surviving in a section which is discussing the feeding of the multitude as attested in the Gospel of John, we have this line, Nichthan anathem hlevam ernam sinesos machtes filus na ustechnida akiach indam them fiskam. 
which means um, he did not only demonstrate an abundance of his power on sort of in those loaves, them hlevam ennem, akiak in them fiskam. So we see, and granted this is talking about a specific miracle, but we do see an association in the little Gothic, Gothic literature that we have surviving of bread being associated with power and with dominance. But we can draw a comparison also with the philology of other languages such as Old English, because in Old English, the word love well, which is the word for Lord, but can also be translated as husband in some contexts, which will be relevant for the sexual connotations we're going to get to in a minute. The word love well, from which we get our modern word Lord, consists of two elements. It's got love, meaning loaf, which is obviously a cognate of the Gothic clefs, which we discussed earlier, and wer, which is guardian, and then that's a cognate itself of the Gothic gardes. We also have a sort of antonym of this, which is the old English word lafata, which is a servant, and it literally means a loaf eater, laf and atta. So we can see here this um, metaphor that's being set up in early medieval England, where a the person who guards the bread has dominance over a family, and the person who eats the bread, which presumably is given only at the will of the Lord, is subordinate to that person. And we're going to get into looking at the implication, or what we can see of the gothic word galeva the sort of influence of that sense that bread can form uh commutative relationships between men and also can serve as a resource by which men exert emotional sorry economic and sexual dominance over subordinates within their family we're going to look at the influence of that con the way of thinking rather in latin literature from visigothic spain but first we need to establish the question, which is a very legitimate one, of whether the Visigoths themselves spoke the Gothic language and whether they read it. Um, because there are actually very, very few references in the historical literature to the Visigoths speaking the Gothic language in quotidian situations. Patrick Amory talks about uh, the state of the Gothic language in Ostrogothic Italy. Now, I think he is a little bit too pessimistic about how much Gothic was spoken in Ostrogothic Italy. Patrick Amory basically claims that if Gothic was spoken at all in Ostrogothic Italy, it was as a language of soldiers that was spoken in military camps and basically nowhere else. And it wouldn't have, and that every Gothic speaker also spoke um, fluent Latin and they would have used Latin in most of their lives. And that sentence is probably true. That the And the same situation appears to have held in Visigothic Spain where Everything is written in Latin. If you look, for instance, at the Bizarras Visigothas, which are the Visigothic, these Visigothic slate tablets that we have surviving, slate tablets which have just ordinary documents written in them. They're written in vulgar Latin, and there's no references to needing a translation or speaking in the original language. Although there are there are a couple of references elsewhere in the um, Vitas Patrum Emeritensium, which is a a text of, containing saints' lives of the Visigothic, uh, of the fathers of Merida, which is a, which was a city in Visigothic Spain, we have reference to Usitato um, Nomine, which is the the commonly used name for wine glasses being flascones, which is clearly a loan word from a Germanic language, flasco, meaning flask. So in that sentence, actually, we have an attested Gothic word um, via the Latin, like we have for the word halirunio, which we don't actually have in the Gothic Bible itself. I'll do a small separate video talking about that because it's a really cool little fragment that we have surviving there. But the point is, the fact that in the Vita's Sanctorum Patrum Emeritensium, in this text, we have a reference to the Gothic word for a wine, a wine bottle being commonly used suggests that either that some gothic words had entered into latin which means that at one point it was commonly spoken enough for loan words to enter in or that other people in the time were speaking gothic and the fact that in this particular excerpt from the text which, which i should have put on the screen and that's my fault for not having done that but in this particular excerpt from the vita sanctorum patrum emeritensium we have the it, it says either 
flascones is the word for these wine glasses or wine bottles. Or they have the word uh, gilones, which is the Latin word for it. So this suggests that there's a Latin way of referring to things in the time period of Visigothic Spain, and there's a Gothic way of referring to things in the time period of Visigothic Spain. So it seems that Goth the Visigoths may have been speaking Gothic to some degree, and we also have some evidence in the poetry of Eugenius of Toledo, who I am going to use as my main source for Visigothic poetry for the rest of this. And just a small side rant about Eugenius of Toledo is um, he's an amazing author. He wrote this um, Libellus Carminum, which is um, a book of songs, a book of poetry. And he just writes poems about all sorts of everyday aspects of his life in Visigothic Spain as a bishop. And it's it's really fun. You get this lovely everyday insights. Um, he was also gay. Uh, and I will do a video explaining exactly how we know that he is gay, but he is very gay. <laughs> and he, one of his poems is poem number 39 on the inventors of letters. And in this poem, he says that, Wulfila promsit getardum quas videmus ultimas, which means, um, videmus ultimas, I should say, which means, Wulfila put out the letters of the Goth, the last letters of the Goths which we see. So he's saying that Wilfler created the Gothic alphabet, which they, they see in their day-to-day -day lives. So clearly in Eugenius of Toledo's time, so this is the 7th century in Spain, Gothic literature was being written, the Gothic language was being written down, and people had, must have had some understanding of it. So I put all of this prologue in to say that Although the Gothic language certainly was never as commonly spoken as Latin in Visigothic Spain, the influence of Gothic languages' metaphors, such as in the word Gaheva, will still have been influential on at least some people in Visigothic Spain, and certainly at the time of Eugenius of Toledo's writing. So there is reason to look into the kinds of metaphors that the Gothic language is drawing in regards to bread, and we're going to do that now by reading through some of Eugenius of Toledo's proverbs and distichs. Now, I call these poems in my videos and other places the quote-unquote Visigothic poems, sorry, the Visigothic proverbs, and one of the reasons is that they are simply called a proverbia in the manuscripts which contain this. Eugenius doesn't claim that he invented these or that they're his own, and many of them actually just sound like generic idioms and sayings that some of which are even very familiar to us today. Um, we have Sat meli or viva in scatula quam functa leania, which is a living cat is better than a dead lioness. And this, you know, echoes a little bit. Um, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, as a proverb that we have in English today. And there is there are so many things in this. These proverbs are replete with thinly veiled sexual metaphor and I'm going to do a whole separate video on them because it's amazing the kinds of metaphors that we get from them and this is one of the sort of ways we can see Eugenius's sexuality coming into play and also many of them simply don't make sense unless you are able to interpret them through a sexual lens. This first one for instance, Fregidus in bellis frustor pecingitur armis, nil valer exterlius de fi dubi propria virtus. It literally means a cold man is vainly girded in battles uh, with his armour. Um, his exterior is worth nothing, nothing when his own virtue is lacking. So that sort of doesn't make sense unless we know that um, with Greco-Roman uh, medical views on sexuality, Fregidus um, when referring to a man, would imply effeminacy and being a bit of a sissy, because women were perceived as cold and wet, as was the season of winter, which is obviously cold, um, as opposed to the hot-headed, violent warrior that someone would be needed, would be expected to be in warfare. So we can see sexual metaphors in all of these proverbs, and I'm going to focus on two in particular, which pertain to uh, bread and these are this one here which is 86 and 85 so let's go on to look at them the my essential argument in this whole thing is that a is that bread or ownership of bread is something which the 
head of the family, the Garda Waldans, to use the Gothic word for this, um, does, and he uses the fact that he is able to go out into society and, with his fellow men, that's the Gahleva part, gain possession of bread. He uses the fact that he is able to do these things to feed his family, which includes non-related people, um, at least the Latin word familiar, includes non-related people such as slaves. He feeds those people, and because he is the person who provides their food, those people are economically dependent on him. And we can see in song number 85 in Eugenius of Toledo, which is one of the Proverbs, we can see the fact that this is this economic dependency leads to sexual dependency also. One very quick thing about the Proverbs, which I forgot to mention earlier, is that um, this one up here, this is also attested outside of Eugenius of Toledo. It is attested in uh, Julian of Toledo's, um, I believe it's the, well, it's one of his, either one of his saints' lives or it's the um, story of King Wamba. And he said this, he just introduces this uh, proverb as, as is commonly said, as is generally said. So this suggests that these poems were not invented by Eugenius of Toledo, but they were common Visigothic sayings, um, which is, you can totally tell from how they sound as well. They sound like proverbs that we would say today. But these are commonly repeated Visigothic proverbs, which seem to have circulated outside of Eugenius of Toledo's own writing. And therefore, we can use them to gain insight into how Visigothic people were thinking about their own culture. And therefore, this proverb, which draws a relationship between the economic dependence of sub family subordinates to the man, to the guard, the wild ones, and their, this association between their economic dependence and their sexual subordination, we can take this, because it's one of the Visigothic proverbs, as reflective of how domestic sexual politics worked in Visigothic Spain more generally. So what does this poem mean? It says, Cum coniux natus vel servus peccat alumnus, cante cavolgus avet nos tamen istalatent. Which means, when a wife, a child, and yes, this is child, natus, it's unfortunate, but they were less concerned about paedophilia back then. Vel servus peccat alumnus, or a well-fed slave sins, pecat. Now, pecare um, is the word referring to sin here, and in sexual contexts, it refers to um, passive homosexual, uh, act or just passive sexual activity. And that's why um, the wife sins, because, because she lacks a penis, she cannot penetrate, and therefore all sex... Um, that she engages in is her sinning. Uh, Natus, a sort of boy, likewise, um, physically is unable to penetrate and therefore um, sins when, well, we would say that the child is raped. And Cerebus, the slave, sins because the slave does not have the sort of social power to penetrate um, the breadwinner of the house, literally the breadwinner. It's a good way to maybe think about the Gothic word uh, Gahleva. And these three all sin. They all do the same kind of sin. And the servus is described as alumnus. And this adjective could also apply to the natus as well. Alumnus. And this means uh, well-fed. And the sort of standard food in the Middle Ages, the sort of, if you said the word food, just in a gener gener generic sense, you were implying either bread or you were implying bread plus something else. Many um, monastic regula, for instance, such as the uh, monastic rule of Fructuosus of Braga, um, suggests that when monks eat their food, they're eating bread plus two other um, food items. So this reference to them being well-fed implies that they're eating bread and they um, are presumably getting their bread from the the breadwinner, from the head of the household, because wives couldn't 
as easily have their own sort of financial resources. Obviously, a slave could not have their own sort of financial resources, and or at least they couldn't. Um, they didn't have their freedom, literally. And likewise, a child is literally dependent on the parents, which would include the father. So these are all economically dependent, according to the first line. And this economic dependence on the breadwinner of the household, who we might refer to as a gahleva, the person who is doing the bread, this causes them to sin, to engage in passive sexual activity. Now, it's interesting, these lines, this last line is, is rather interesting actually. Um, um, which means the common people get, get songs about it. So the common people sing songs about the fact that the, the wife, the child and the slave are getting fucked. Um, which gives us a sort of insight into what the Visigoths were singing about in their music. It might not have been this glorious heroic warrior poetry that some might like to imagine <laughs> it was much more vulgar uh, those songs however are silent about us so this proverb is presumably meant to be repeated by men and it's cons and specifically by sort of masculine fellow men to distinguish themselves by distancing themselves from economic and sexual subordinates and that is wives, children, and slaves. So the Eugenius's interest in this, I think, is partly linked to his own uh, sense of inadequacy on the basis of his homosexuality, which is a theme which recurs over and over again in his poetry, honestly, in quite a sad fashion. Um, but loads of these um, proverbs that he gives here are about a masculine person distinguishing themselves as a real man against sissies. This not, first one is like that, the second one is like that, third one, fourth one, fifth one. Um, uh, this this one as well. There's so there are so many um, so many sort of references or distancings from homosexuality in his poetry. Now, let's, speaking of which, go on to one of his poems that actually deals with bread directly. And this is his song number 86. And it says, Pane suvo vivens alienia negotia supplens, iste sanus eger est. Now, what does this mean? Um, this is the, the aliena negotia, which is sort of strange dealings. Um, in the context of this proverb are a euphemism implying illicit sexual relationships. Now, I believe um, in the writings of, in the poetry of Magnus Felix and Nordius, we have some references to Aliena um, to refer to things which are implied to be homosexual activities. It echoes also the writings of the North African poet Luxorius, who describes um, an effeminate lawyer as engaging in uh, causa steriles, so sort of sterile arguments, useless things. So this, this, this coding of homosexual activity as strange, unnatural and weird businesses is quite common in literature of the time period. And this proverb, if we translate it literally, frankly doesn't make that much sense. Um, we would translate this as a man living on his own bread, um, still exchanging strange dealings. Um, this healthy man is actually sick. It's like, what does this mean? Doing strange dealings, living on his bread. How do we make sense of it? And I think that if we based on what we've said before, if we take Gahleva, a fellow doer of the bread, not like fucking the bread, but a person who distributes the bread to his family and therefore makes his family both economically and sexually subordinate to him. He makes them sexually subordinate to him because they are economically dependent on him in a similar way as the old English laugh word is superior to the hlaf atta because he is um, able to provide this hlaf atta with bread. Likewise, 
I think this poem is implying that a fellow bread doer who is able to provide bread for himself should not be engaging in aliena negotia, strange dealings, which arguably is implying homosexual sexual activity in the same way that um, the sin of the previous proverb refers to uh, passive sexual activity. The image that's being set up here is that it's it's normal and it's healthy for somebody who is economically dependent, for a man, I should say, who is economically dependent on another to engage in passive homosexual activity. That is a sort of standard part of life. But a gahleva, a, a, a sort of man who is able to provide his own bread, who is still doing that anyway, could only be engaging in passive homosexual activity out of some kind of mental illness. This is edgerest. And this association with mental illness, we can actually see it written into Visigothic law. And this is going to be the last text on which I end the video. This is a law um, by Flavius Kinderswinthus Rex, um, King Kinderswith of the of the Visigoths concerning um, male, goodness, concerning male crimes or disgraces. And this is essentially a law which is outlawing homosexuality. And it draws an explicit link between, um, not only between homosexuality and mental illness, but it also exempts those who do so against their will and this would include obviously um slaves so in this line here hoc interim ordendum decus si in perens quisque vel partiens non voluntarius sed invitus explese di nocitur unc areatu poterit immunis averi si nefandi uius celeris ipsi detector exiterit so Oh, and ille procul dubio de nendus est ad pennam, quem menax ponte devolutum constat in saniam. So this sentence shows us th this explicit link. It says, um, however, this horrible disgrace, um, if the person who is inferens vel patiens, so inferens, in, the implication is topping, bearing in, velpatians, or suffering, because um, in Latin literature, um, essentially taking dick is perceived as suffering, and this goes back to the Roman poet Martial, who described passive homosexual activity as muliebria pati, which means to suffer womanly things. So the patians, the one who is suffering, uh, is the, the bottom in this context. Um, so the top or the bottom, um, non Voluntarius, um, not of his own will, said invitus, but unwillingly, explicit in oscitur, dun carea tu patrit immunis averi. Um, then he can be held as immune f um, by the sort of, by the court, by the prosecutor. So a person who is engaging in homosexual activity against his will, which is what slaves and, you know, certainly children, the economic dependents are doing it against their will because they're being exploited, because they have no choice but to engage in this activity, they are exempt from it. Sine um, uio ipsi detector exiterit. If they themselves um, appear to be the person who revealed this this crime. Ille procul dubio tenendus est penam. But he, without doubt, is to be held to that penalty. Queme nax ponte devolutum constat in Who is held to have um, fallen into um, such insanity. Sorry, um, who it seems has fallen into such insanity. Insania. Um, in hax ponte. Of his own will, basically. And so this is essentially echoing the same sentiment that we see in Eugenius of Toledo's Visigothic Proverbs, that a, a gahleva, a man who is able to provide for himself, who, um, who, what's the word, 
gives in to such sexual proclivities is insane, is mentally unwell, basically. So I, well, th th that poem is for a different day, but the conclusion, the takeaway that I want to leave you guys with about how we should interpret the Gothic word Gatheva is that it also contains an implied sexual component. My view, which I hope I've gotten across in this video, is that when we read the Gothic word Gatheva, or we rather when we read Visigothic literature um, written in Latin pertaining to bread but also to sexual politics, in conjunction with an etymological breakdown of the Gothic word Gatheva, we can see how for the Visigoths, bread was a mediator of sexual relationships. Bread was a resource that masculine men, masculine warrior men, went out and with their fellow men, with their fellow warriors, their synstathiotes, as they would say in Greek, with their fellow warriors, these with their fellow men, these Visigothic warriors obtained bread, they obtained the hlefs, which they brought home and could distribute to their families who were economically dependent on literally the breadwinner. And that economic dependence led them to be sexually dependent or sexually subordinate, I should say, to the breadwinner, to the gahleva. And this uh, metaphor for bread mediating certain kinds of sexual relationships in honestly an acceptable manner was written into Visigothic culture in the form of Visigothic proverbs and later got inscribed into Visigothic law to a lesser extent as well, although in the Visigothic law code the there is no explicit reference to the use of bread, but there is still reference to the use to the um idea of uh, a, a a sort of provider still engaging in such sexual activity, um, only doing so out of mental illness, and there is also a reference to economic dependence engaging in homosexual activity, being exempt from penalty and not regarded as insane. So essentially, in Visigothic Spain, taking bread from another man is in fact gay. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. And I also really hope that the point I was trying to get across has actually gotten across with this. I know it's a really... Um, complicated argument, this argument that uh, breadwinners of Visigothic households used their provision of bread to the families to sexually subordinate them, including, uh, including male slaves, and that this therefore could be used in certain contexts as a metaphor to describe homosexual activity, like in this proverb about a man living on his bread but still doing weird things, the fact that he's living on his own bread but still engaging in homosexual activity like a dependent is what demonstrates his um, insanity as the law says that homosexuals are indeed insane. I hope that that relatively complex um, argument has gotten through and it shows some of the benefits of studying the Gothic language because it helps us to understand Visigothic literature even better. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I will try to get to them. Um, remember to like, comment and subscribe. And if you want me to teach you Latin or Gothic or any, uh, well, Old English, I guess as well, you can subscribe to my Patreon, which will also be linked in the description. And also uh, join my Discord server if you want to for a fun community of people who are interested in history and politics and all other kinds of fun things. So thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you guys later. Bye!